was Sheikh Rashid Rida. And so Rashid Rida began to write inside his uh, Al Manar magazine. He began to write article after article criticizing his book and exposing his book and exposing the arguments as being completely invalid arguments and showing how Islam, the Khilafah system, was part of Islam from the very beginning and how Rasulullah was a politician and a leader as well as a prophet and a messenger and how the Khulafa after him ruled not according to their own whims and desires but they ruled according to the Kitab and the Sunnah and then Rashid Rada began to call upon Azhar to come out and say things to come out and take a stand this is one of your own graduates one of the Azhar graduates has come out and say this so Azhar has to take a position against him and at the same time, there were ulama even as far away as Tunisia, such as Ibn Ashur, who were writing books, criticizing and refuting the ideas of Ali ibn Razi. And then the Azhar came together, and the council of ulama of 23 scholars called Ali ibn Razi to court. And so Ali ibn Razi came to court, and basically it was a court upon whether this man, his ideas were heretical. <coughs> Already when he came to court, it was clear, he said, entered the court, he said, Salaamu Alaikum, and you can even read inside the news reports about this issue. He said, Salaamu Alaikum, and no one replied to him. So he entered into the room with 23 other scholars. He said, Salaamu Alaikum, he's entering as an other scholar as well. Salaamu Alaikum, the 23 of them remain silent. Then they began to list all the charges against him, send him out of the room, and later on they come back and they issue their fatwa made up, I think, of seven points, which completely refuted everything the Ali of the Raziq was saying. And then even the Shaykh of Asr at the time wrote a whole book called Al Islam wa Hakikut al Hukum, Islam and the Reality of the Rule. And in that book he began to list all the examples of Rasulullah implementing education policy, implementing military policy. Every aspect of ruling, he was bringing examples from the Sunnah and how Rasulullah acted in those particular areas. So this was happening, brothers, in 1925-1926. And so what they did with Ali Abdul Razik, they removed him from the circle of ulama, and they took away his ajaz, and they took away his uh, right to be an Azari graduate. It's like cancelling your degree. You had your degree 10 years ago, khalas ago, your degree is now cancelled. So he was cancelled. He was no longer an Azar Sheikh. He was an ex Azar Sheikh. Cancelled by who? By the Council of the Great Scholars from Azhar. This was the position they took in front of this man. Because he was someone, he wasn't just like Taha Hussein and these other people who were, everyone knew them to be westernized and lost people, liberalized people who had no idea about Islam. This was a man coming along claiming to be a scholar of Islam. And so they had to put this right straight away. But the problem wasn't, the problem brothers was, even though they expelled him, even though they written all these books, showing that Islam was supposed to be part of the ruling and the Khilaf was part of Islam and the society continued to go down. Khilaf was abolished and no one was bringing it back again. At the time in Egypt, the immorality and the, uh, the liberal values were appearing more and more in the society. The newspapers and the journalists were writing more and more about it. The books were being released, pushing for liberalism and these kind of ideas. And so around that time there was a gathering of some ulama and some young activists who were Islamically inclined. And one of these ulama, his name was Sheikh uh, Dajjum. This Sheikh, he began to lament and complain. He began to say, you know, look at all this poison which is coming out in the society. And then he began to complain about the weakness of the Islamic forces in front of all of its enemies. And then he began to talk about his group, or a group which he had been working with. This one today is called Nahda the Youth, or Nahda the Youth. This one in the time of uh, Sheikh al-Dajmi, he would call it Nahda al-Islam, Revival of Islam. This was a group which they had, talking about the revival of Islam. He said, this group, we've been writing letters. 
We've been going to conferences, we've been presenting papers, and it's made absolutely no difference. The society is going downhill. And so then the Sheikh, after his complaining, said, you know what? In this time that we're living in, in this day and age that we're living in, it's enough for someone to save himself and to protect his deen. That was his opinion. We've tried everything, we can't do anything. Therefore, in this day, it's enough for someone just to look to protect himself and his family and forget about everything else. If he can protect his deen and protect his family, it's enough for him. He quoted the ayah, that Allah does not burn a soul by more than what it bears. And then inside that city, inside that very gathering, one young man said to him, Ya Shaykh, Wallahi, I don't see the things the way you see them. He said, I don't see the things the way you see it. And just because the situation has become bad, just because the situation you know, we see the evil and the domination of the foreign culture. Just because of this, it doesn't mean that's an excuse for us to sit down and do nothing. It doesn't mean that that's an excuse for us to remain seated. It doesn't mean that that's an excuse for us to run away from the difficulties. And then the ulama around him began to say, Do you know who you're talking to? The young man talking to one of the shiukh of Ashar. And they began to criticize him until the sheikh stopped them. I said, no, no, Allah, he's, let him speak. He's just saying what's from the heart. That young man was Hassan al-Banna. That young man was Hassan al-Banna before he established Ikhwan al Muslim. That young man just sat there and said to the Shaykh, La ara kama tara. I don't see it the way which you see it. That young man in 1928, when he was a teacher in Ismailiyah, a group of young men came to him and they said to him, we need to do something for the sake of Islam. And we do not see the path the way that you see the path. And so then be our leader. And upon that basis, in 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood was born. So let's briefly mention who was this man, a Shaheed Hassan al Banna, who was born in 1906. So at this time, 1928, by the time he established the Khan al-Muslimin, makes him 22 years old. Yeah, and in the time when she stood up and confronted the Shaykh, or tried to not confront the Shaykh, what I mean is let the Shaykh know that this defeatism and pessimism was not from Islam, he was maybe 20 years old. So he was born in 1906 to a family. His father was someone quite religious, mashaAllah. And I think he's written both in a book which has some ta'rifat, has some comments on the Muslim of uh, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. And at a young age, he memorized Quran. From a young age, 10, 11, 12, something like this, Hassan al-Banna had memorized Quran at the hands of his father. And he used to, after the Fajr prayer inside the masjid, he used to attend the Jalasat of the Ulama. And so, for example, he mentions how he used to sit and he used to discuss issues like Rasul al Fiqh. And he used to discuss issues like uh, uh, Imam Ghazali's Ahiyya Ulum al Deen. Obviously, and he was a young man, he was inside the masjid. It's not uh, uh, the great detail, the level of, you know, inside the university courses or something like that. But he used to always love to go to these sessions and participate in them. And also at the same time, while he was growing up 15, 16 years old, he was also a member of the Hasafiyya Sufi order. So he was also a Sufi at that time. But even though he was a Sufi, he mentions, even though I was into the Sufiyya and I, had, I used to follow this order, at the same time, whenever there was any political issue, I used to go on the streets with the rest of the people. So he used to take part inside the protests that were taking place after World War I against the British which were taking place in, in Egypt at that time. Then when it was time for him to go to university, his family or his father, or they wanted him to go to Azhar. But he did not want to go to Azhar. So he didn't go to Azhar University to become yani, the uh, uh, sheikh by qualification. Like Ali Abdul Razak. But rather, he went to Dar al 
which is the college for teaching Arabic language and other subjects, but it's very famous for the Arabic language. And after that he became a teacher, which is why he was in Ismailiya, because he'd been sent to be a teacher in that area. And so Hassan al-Banna, you see that he grew up in an Islamic household, and you see that he grew up in an Islamic environment, and you see the people that he was spending time with, people like Rashid al uh, and all these ulama who were in the sitting of uh, uh, Shaykh al-Dajwi. So he grew up around these personalities, and he grew up at the time when the Khilaf was abolished, and this whole argument was taking place between Ali ibn Razik and the ulama of Azhar and Rashid al So he grew up witnessing all of that. He was in his university years at this time, or just finished. So he was really involved in all these kind of issues. And so he knew, he knew the fundamental importance of the Khilafah to Islam. Which is why he said inside his own words, and the Khilafah rams wahd al-Ummah. That the Khilafah is the symbol of the unity of the Ummah. And that's why he also mentioned some years later, when giving speech for Ikhwan al-Muslimin in one of the conferences, he said, الإخوان المسلمون يجعلون فكرة الخلافة والعمل لإعادتها في رأس مناهجهم. That the Muslim brothers made the idea of the خلافة and the work for its return at the head of its manhaj, at the head of its methods. So he understood the importance and the centrality of the خلافة in Islam and he also understood the importance of government and governance in Islam. Which is why he said that the Ikhwan al-Muslimun, what had they done? يَجْعَلَ الْحَكُومَ رُكْنًا لِلْأَرْكَانِ They had made the government a pillar from amongst its pillars. A pillar from amongst the pillars of its principles. And Hassan al-Banna also understood how authority was needed in order for Islam to be implemented. Which is why in his writings he used to write about the words of the Khalifa, Uthman bin Affan, that the Sultan, the authority was there in order to correct by the sword or by the authority in order for Allah to correct with the authority what was not corrected by the Qur'an. Yani the one who does not have taqwa and prevents himself from doing the wrong things, then the law prevents him from doing the wrong things. So Hassan al-Banna grew up in this environment and grew up with these ulama inside these discussions. And so he understood all of this. And he grew up seeing a society which had been colonized and occupied by the British. And even though, even though in 1922, the Egypt was given its independence supposedly, he knew this was an independence only on paper. Why? Because the British were still in control of the government, practically speaking. Even if there was the king, and there was the parliament, and there was the constitution, but it was the British ambassador who used to say, jump and everyone jumps. Sit and everyone sits. Not only that, but the critical areas in Egypt, such as the Suez Canal, was underneath the authority and the ownership still of the British. It's like someone takes your house and says, you know what? You can have your house back and you can stay inside the toilet and we'll take the rest. And because this obviously the Suez Canal is such a vital importance strategically inside that area for the ships to pass through. So the British did not want to give that back to the sovereignty of Egypt. They remained underneath the uh, British sovereignty or underneath their company's sovereignty. And at the same time, liberalization or liberalism and secularism was being really uh, pushed inside the society. And at the same time, the Muslim ulama and the Islamic leaders were having almost no effect whatsoever upon preventing this from taking place. And this is why Hassan al-Banna, when he saw all these issues taking place inside the society, he stood up to the Shaykh al and said to him, this is not an excuse for us to remain seated. But he didn't just say it, brothers. He wasn't one of those people who just says, you know, says something and then he doesn't do it. Why do you say that which you don't do? But rather he acted upon his words. And he realized and recognized 
that the Masajid was not a place for the da'wah in those days. Because the Masajid was somewhere where everyone came just to receive the normal Islamic knowledge. What I mean by the normal Islamic knowledge, I mean what they considered by taqlid, the Islamic knowledge. Yani, when people came to the masjid, they expected to be told about tahara, and about salah, and about siyam, and maybe on a good day about akhlaq. This is what the people were expecting when they went to the masjid, because their minds had been told that Islam is nothing to do with ruling, and it was beginning to take root inside their minds. So what did he do? Hassan al-Banja left the masjid. He didn't used to give da'wah inside the masajid, but rather he used to go around all the cafes and give da'wah in the cafes. And it's mentioned that he used to give the da'wah there and people would sit and listen to this young man. Don't forget, he's 20, 21 years old at this time. Young man coming and telling them about Islam. Very strange. Someone comes to the cafe where people are sitting down, drinking the tea, drinking the coffee. These are more religious people. And he's there telling them about Islam, reminding them about heaven and hell, trying to give them some guidance. And he would keep a short, you know, short discussion and then he would stop. And then the people would offer him, come and sit down with us and drink some tea, drink some coffee. And he'd say, no, no. He would refuse to take any tea or coffee from him. He'd say, I don't want to take payment for what I've done. That was his mentality, subhanAllah. Today, and his brothers, people tell me that they run the Islamic society. And if they want to bring someone to come and give a talk inside the Islamic society, such and such a sheikh cost 50 pounds. This is the small sheikh. The biggest sheikh cost 150 pounds. And if you really want the big, big sheikh, he costs 500 pounds. And one is very uh, astounded by such words like this. Alhamdulillah. So, Hassan al Bandar refused even just to take a cup of tea or a cup of coffee from them. Because he wanted to make them realize that he was doing this simply for the sake of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this style attracted a lot of people, a lot of young people to him. So when he was transferred to Ismailiya to be a teacher there, he found himself in, a, in, a, in an even worse situation in the sense of the society because Ismailiya was full of British people. And so he used to see all the time the British army and the people, whatever else. And he, he, he used to become very frustrated by this. And so he used to give khutbah against them, and he used to still do the same thing, go around to the cafes and give the da'wah. And this is how a number of these youth people hearing him giving the da'wah, they are the ones who came to him in his house and said to him, we have to do something, Ya Shaykh. And you're the one who sees what we should do. We don't see, we just know we have to do something. We know we should do something, but you're the one who knows what we should do. And so take agreement from us and let's go forward together. And so then they took an agreement, they took a contract with each other to establish a brotherhood to be what? To be mujahideen inside the da'wah. To be soldiers inside the da'wah to Islam. And this is how Hassan al-Banda went around attracting the people to Islam because he wasn't giving them that same message which was being heard inside the masjids. Rather he was going to them in the cafes and telling them the reality of what Islam was about. And so he told them, Al-Islam, Deen, or oh, Islam, Hukum, Wa Tanfeed. Islam is the law, and it's the implementation of that law. Kama huwa tashri' wa ta'aleem. Just as it is legislation and education. Kama huwa qanun wa khada. Just as it is law, and it is uh, judging, and yani judging between the people. And Hassan al-Banna was well known for struggling against secularism. After he established Ikhwan al-Muslimin, they used to have different newspapers which would come out and different leaders which would come out. He was very well known for taking such a strong stance against secularism. Such that when Taha Hussein wrote a book in the 1930s uh, proposing these ideas, more secularism and more Western liberalism and so on and so forth. And everyone can return back to the books of Taha Hussein if they really wish to and see the things he was talking about. A number of people rejected him, even some other scholars and whatever else. But Hassan al-Banna was the one who gathered the people into a city, maybe something like this city, and he went through Taha Hussein's book and point by point destroyed the false ideas of secularism which was inside the book. But what was amazing about this situation was that Taha Hussein himself attended in secret. So he arranged to attend the meeting. It'd be like someone sitting behind the curtains at the back. So he wouldn't know that they were there. 
So he arranged to attend the meeting in secret and he sat there listening to everything which Hassan al-Banna has said. And then he contacted Hassan al-Banna later and said to him, I came to you and I listened to what you were saying, but I did it in secret. And he said, Wallahi, wait, no Wallahi, because this man is a secularist. But he said, you're the only one out of all the people who reject me and rebuke me, you're the only one who I come to listen to. Because everyone else is kalam khair and it's empty words. Whereas you have something specific to say. So this is what Hassan al-Banna was well known for. However, even though he was giving this da'wah to Islam, and the da'wah was implementing Islam, and Islam hukum wa is a rule, a law, and implementation, he saw that there was a big obstacle in the way of this implementation, which was the British occupation. This was the big obstacle in the way. So he would consistently write in his magazines about how the Qur'an had to be the basis of the law inside the country. And had to be the basis of the government. And he used to account the government consistently. The government at this time, brothers, obviously the British were behind the scenes. The front scene of the government was had the king, and then you had the parliament, and you had different political parties inside the parliament. So you had the liberal constitutionists, and you had the Waft, and you had different parties there, and you had a constitution backing it all, which was basically taken from the Western European constitutions. And Hassan al used to account all of these people, he used to account them and said, Look, I don't mind the constitution. Because inside the Egyptian constitution it's written that Islam is the deen of the nation. It's written that very clearly inside the constitution that Islam is the deen of the nation. So I don't have a problem with the constitution. This was his opinion. We can discuss his opinion later if need be. But he said I don't find a problem with the constitution because it says that Islam is the deen. And I don't find a problem with the parliament either. The reason I don't find a problem with parliament is because when you have a ruler in Islam, when you have a Khalifa in Islam, he is supposed to be accountable. So he has to has he has to have a majlis ashura, he has to have a shura council which accounts him. The ummah, it's the right of the ummah to account the leader. And so this parliament is just a way to help us account the leader. So I don't mind the parliamentary system. But the problem with this whole thing is all of the laws that you're passing are not Islam. They are not according to Islam. And the other problem is that the governments, we are all separated. First of all, within our own country, we have all these political parties. And Hassan al banna was someone who said that to have more than one political party was haram. He said to have the waft and to have the liberal constitutionists and to have this and to have that. All of these parties and groups are haram. This was his opinion. And he said the Quran Muslim is not, is not a party like those parties. He said all this is haram because all these groups, they just run for their own interests. They're not, they're not there to account the rule or anything like that. They're just there to get into parliament. They're just there for their own interests. So that's why it's leading to disunity. Because each of them is competing with one another. Instead of doing what? You're competing with one another to reach the parliament instead of fighting against the British. That's what's his point. And how can you have a parliament and you have a, a, a ruler and you have a constitution and the British are the ones ruling you? And you're wasting your time competing over getting to the parliament when you're being occupied. It makes no difference how many of you are in the parliament or not because the ultimate decision lies with the occupier. And the other point of disunity was that our Muslim countries should not be separate. And he used to write how it's a big shame that we've been cut into so many small and little nations. And that's been done by the enemies of Islam in order to weaken Islam. And so Hassan al-Banna saw very clearly at this time that the main problem was not really the parliament, was not really the constitution, was not really the king, was not really the government. The main problem at this time was the occupation. Once they go rid of the occupation, we could be able to rule by Islam. Because, you know, that's what people want. People want to rule by Islam. But he realized as well that it was going to take time for him to prepare his people and his group for those necessary sacrifices and actions to remove the British occupation. And so he made a program. And he said, my program is in three stages. The first stage is just general da'wah and to make people aware of what we're saying. The second stage is to mobilize the masses until we overthrow these people and then the third stage is the stage of implementation. 
So you had three stages. General calling the people, then mass mobilization, getting all the people to revolt, basically, civil unrest, and then we implement Islam once we're free. And he said each stage will take 10 years. So the first stage, 1928 to 1930, roughly. Those 10 years, just general call. Then the next 10 years, 1930 to 1948, that's when we're going all out, getting the people onto the streets and really accounting, the government accounting against the occupation. This is why you find most of his large conferences and most of his harsh words happen when? In the late 1930s, after the middle of 1930s. Before that, you don't hear much from Hassan al and Iqbal al-Muslim. They're having some events here and there, but generally speaking, they're gathering people. And then in 1936, two events happened. The first event, 1936, that the Egyptian government re-signed the agreement with the British regarding the Suez Canal. The agreement was about to come to an end. The sovereignty was supposed to go back to the Egyptians. They re-signed it and gave the sovereignty or the control of it back to the British again. This was the first event which happened. And the second event which happened was the Arab revolt in Palestine. These were two events which happened in 1936. Regarding the first event, Hassan al-Banna was angry, furious. And he wrote a letter. He wrote a famous letter called Nahu al -Mur, towards the light. And he sent that letter to his own government and the Egyptian government. But not only to the Egyptian government, he sent it to all of the Arab governments. He sent it to the government of Iraq sent to the government of Saudi, he sent it to each and every Arab government this letter. And what did he say inside this letter? He said we have two things we have to do. After criticizing them for all they've been doing, he said there are two things we have to do. The first one, تَخْلِيسُ الْأُمَّةِ مِنْ قُيُودِ حَسْيَسِيَةِ Removing from the Ummah the political change around them. Meaning what? Liberate the land from the British. Because it wasn't just Egypt which was occupied at this time. Many of the Islamic countries were still occupied with a pseudo independence. So this was his first point. We have to free the Islamic lands from the chains of colonialism. Then, then to build the Islamic state from you. And he said, you're going to have in front of you two choices. فَأَمَّا تَرِيقَ الْأَوَّلِ أو فَأَمَّا الْأَوَّلِ فَتَرِيقَ الْإِسْلَامِ As for the first way, it's the way of Islam. The way of Islam and its pillars and its rules and its civilization. And as for the second way, it's the way of the West. And the civilization of the West and the culture of the West. And he encountered them and said to them, how can you turn towards the West and the Western way and the Western culture and the Western ideas when everything within Islam is sufficient for you? And it's the Western leadership which is destroying the world. And he wrote that secularism, which everyone is rolling through these days, is a purely Western phenomenon which has nothing to do with Islam and cannot be applied upon Islam. So this was the first thing which he did with regards to the situation of the Suez Canal. The second thing, which was Palestine, Ikhwan al Muslimin at this time released a book which is titled The Fire and Destruction in Palestine. The Fire and Destruction and not with the modern Palestine. The Fire and Destruction in Palestine. And inside that book were pictures of torture and destruction that the British were doing against the Arabs and the Muslims in Palestine. And so they gave this book and they just printed it and put copies of it everywhere. And by the time the second or the third print of it was out, Hassan al-Banda found himself in jail. They locked him up and put him in jail. The Egyptian government locked him up and put him in jail because of this book. And when the British ambassador heard that he was in jail, he quickly realized that this was a disaster. You're going to put this man in jail, you're going to make him a hero. And so he is the one who ordered the Egyptians to release him. The Egyptians were trying to be good to the British masters. This guy's causing a problem for the British by releasing all this propaganda, let's arrest him. The British were more smart. The king and the government, they're their henchmen. The henchmen are always the foolish people, and the brains, the evil brains behind it, is the one who is more smart. So the British government was more smart, 
and said, if we arrest this man and put him into jail, you're going to make him into a martyr. So release him straight away. So this young 30-something-year-old Hassan al-Manna was released almost, you know, very soon after that. And Ikhwan al-Muslim, some of them were sent to Palestine and participated inside the Arab revolt at that time. And so those years, they became very heated years between Hassan al-Banna and between the British and between the British-sponsored government. To the point that in 1940, there were even problems occurring within the Ikhwan al-Muslim. There were problems occurring within the group itself. And some of the members of the group were accounting Hassan al-Banna. And they were saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inside the Quran, whoever does not rule, when the Yahku in the of Allah, whoever doesn't rule what Allah has revealed, for Ulaika who kafiru, then those people are the disbelievers. They were coming with this ayah and telling him, Look, this government is backing the British and they love the British and they're following the British. So this ayah applies to them. So how can we remain silent upon them? And so amongst them was one of the main members of Ikhwan al Muslimin who was Ahmed Rafa. And Hassan al Banda refused them. And said to him, he still gave the benefit of the doubt. He still believed that there was good inside even the government. And he still believed that it was the British occupation which was forcing them to act a particular way. In other words, if we get rid of the British, then these guys will come back to their roots and will apply Islam. They're only not doing it now because they are chained. And so these people, Ahmed Rafat and his group, they slipped away from the Ikhwan al-Muslimin in this time. And there was another group uh, uh, formed, which was called the Youth of Muhammad. At this time, and this is another, another story about, uh, about this group. Then 1942, even Hassan al banna tried to run for elections. Many people look at Hassan al banna running for elections and they say, look, Hassan al banna he agrees with the government. And he thinks the government is all okay and we can run for elections today and whatever else, taking everything out of the context. What did Hassan al banna say about his own running for elections? Two years later, he's writing inside his magazines why they ran for elections. And he said, the reason we ran for election is because the parliament is like a pulpit. It's like a member for doing da'wah. Yeah, and we get into the parliament and we hear speeches and give da'wah. That's why he ran for the parliament. And it makes sense anyway. Why else would he run? Because he, he, only one or two of the ikhwan run. It's not like they were going to try and take power inside the government. They just wanted to give some da'wah inside the parliament themselves. To have some protection and whatever else. And he knew anyway that the parliament was worthless. So Hassan al banna knew very clearly that there was no implementation before liberation. Which is why he said, and again and again he kept saying, the first goal, what's the first goal of the Muslim Brotherhood? He wasn't going for elections inside the parliament. The first goal of the Muslim Brotherhood was, and yet the Harar al Watan al Islami min kulli sultan al to liberate the Islamic lands from the foreign authority. That was the first goal and remained the first goal of Ikhwan al-Muslimin throughout the life of Hassan al-Banna because they never achieved the liberation even while he was alive. So that was always the first primary goal of Hassan al-Banna. And so he was working for liberation. Which is why when 1940, what did he do? He established himself Nidam Khas. He established the secret apparatus within the Ikhwan al-Muslimin. His own secret side, which was separate from the public face of Ikhwan, which was like the military face of Ikhwan. Why? Not to fight against the government, but because he said none of the none of the Arab armies are worth anything to do. They're all worthless. And so we established the secret apparatus in order for the Arabs to have the army, in order for the Muslims to have their army. Yani, this Nidam Khas was intended to fight in Palestine and to fight against the British inside the Suez. That's why the Nidam Khas was instigated and made not in order to fight against the government or to just create fit inside the society, as some of the native people said. But he did say in 1940 as well, he did say in one, if all the doors in front of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin are shut, then we know that we have to use the power in order to open the doors. So he was someone who understood this. And he knew there would come a time, brothers. He knew there would come a time when he would have to confront the British. Do you know one of the first books which he wrote after he established the Muslim Brotherhood? Within the first year of establishing the Ikhwan al-Muslimun, what was his first, one of his 
first books was Risala al Jihad. Small little Risala, which he mentions all of the Ahkam of Jihad. This is one of the first little booklets that he wrote after establishing the Muslim Brotherhood. So by 1948, brothers, this was after World War II, and Hassan al Banna had had great hope that the government would have done something by then. By 1948, he had lost hope. And then they began to raise what he called it the Ma'arat al Quran, the struggle of the Quran. And they began to raise the slogan, Aina Allah, where is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And a big struggle emerged between the Ikhwan and between the government at that time. And he stated very plainly, he said, if a state does not implement the Sharia, then it would not be an Islamic state, whatever its constitution says. So even if the Egyptian constitution says that it's Islamic, if it doesn't implement the Sharia, then it's not an Islamic state. And he said, and if the people are content with that, are content with the people, with the state not implementing Sharia, then they are not an Islamic people, even if they claim to. These were the words of who? Hassan al banna <coughs> Then, as a result of all these struggles and the unrest and the bombs went off because at this time in the Nadal Khas began to fight against the British and so bombs went off in the different hangouts that the British used to stay in and the armies and the soldiers or whatever else and some of them were killed. <coughs> then, Nukrashi, who was the Prime Minister of the time, banned the Muslim Brotherhood. This is 1948. And in December of 1948, Nukrashi himself was assassinated, killed, by one young member, rogue member, of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, and Hassan al-Banna straight away came out and denounced this action, and said it's a wrong action, and he's not from the Brotherhood. And then within two months, in the February of 1929, Hassan al-Banna himself was assassinated. Allah, we ask maybe, inshaAllah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts him as shaheed in the night be established. And he mentioned in his own words, مَا لَمْ تَقِمْ هَذِهِ الدَّوْلَةِ As long as this state is not established, فَإِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ جَمِيعًا آثِمُونَ Then all of the Muslims are sinful. مَسْبُولُونَ بَيْنِ يَدَيَ اللَّهِ عَلِيهِ الْكَرِيرِ الْكَرِيرِ Question in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high, الْكَرِيرِ عَنْ تَقْسِرِهِمْ فِي إِقَامَتِهَا In their shortcoming in establishing it. And they're sitting down on bringing it about. So, brothers, when we want to understand the legacy of Hassan al-Banna, and when we want to understand how it should be applied today, it's no use for someone just to pick up his messages and to read them and to think that the situation today is like the situation then. Because he was a man who was living underneath occupation. <coughs> and so, he didn't know what to deal with the government until he first removed the occupation. And his ultimate aim was to establish the Dawlat al-Islam or Dawlat al-Islamiyya and then after this to establish Dawlat al-Khilaf. This was his ultimate aim. And unfortunately, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not unfortunately, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani, this man was killed before he even saw the liberation of Egypt. But if he had seen the liberation of Egypt, my brothers, if he had seen the liberation of Egypt, and so what occurred afterwards? Then we need to ask ourselves the question, what would his position have been towards this so-called liberated governments today? And what would have been his opinion of them? And how would he have acted towards them? And this is the kind of message, or this is the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves in a deep and uh, يعني, thorough manner, rather than simply taking the slogans of Hassan al-Banna and saying them today as though the situation of Egypt today underneath Al-Fir'aun uh, Mubarak is the same as the situation of when he was living underneath the occupation of the British.